Welcome, welcome very, very much to Conversation. It's an honor and a pleasure to welcome to the program Wayne M. Raskin, PhD. He's the Dean of Arts and Sciences for my alma mater, Wayne University, Wayne State University in Detroit. And Wayne, welcome so very, very much to Conversations. It's nice to be talking about my hometown and my alma mater. Welcome. Well, great to be it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Now, it's my pleasure and so forth. We've been in communication. We're going to be talking about the city of Detroit in some length. We're going to be doing this first segment uh, is going to be about the phenomena of Detroit on a na national and international scale because it's a, it's a singular story to be told. It'll be aware, many people in the audience will be aware that they've had great difficulty in the recent past with uh, a city that had been the arsenal of democracy at the time of the Second War and also uh, uh, very, very prominent because it was the center of the automobile industry and so forth. And then it went into very difficult times and it's now hopefully coming out of that. But we're going to be talking about all of that. So I'm happy to be able to be, uh, to be in, that, in that situation. I wonder if we could though, you're a serious, I looked at your bio or your resume you are a serious mathematician, and I wonder if maybe we could take a little while. We'll have some clips we're going to include in this first segment. A little bit of your own personal background, born and raised in education. You are a serious mathematician. Uh, it goes on and on, all kind of, uh, the understanding mathematics. Maybe you could share your own background if you could, please. Well, thank you very much. Um, well, um, um, I come from Boston, mm -hmm. and um, I was born and raised there, and uh, my father was a cloth cutter mm -hmm. and he worked um, when I was a kid in a factory in South Boston and I worked with him um, for several summers when I when I was a teenager mm -hmm. it was my mother's way of, of convincing us that we did not want to go into that business <laughs> uh, and it, it was very successful uh, yeah I got that, you that, yeah, that, yeah. That, um, but you, you you said in an earlier thing you you were interested in mathematics even after you were as young as five you could see you had a knack or a feeling or an appreciation of the elegance of mathematics yeah that's correct. Yes. Uh, so yeah. I have four older brothers, and um, at least two of them were were very interested in mathematics. Uh -huh. And so I would listen to what they said, and I would sometimes um, talk to them as as they were doing their homework. Mm -hmm. And uh, and one of those brothers is um, 11 years older than I am. Mm -hmm. So so when when he was in college, I was in elementary school, and so I would hear words, you know, like calculus and logic. Yeah. And I was fascinated by them, and I would ask them questions, and I I uh, I picked up some of the vocabulary and some of the concepts, and I found them very interesting. And so, aside from maybe um, playing in the NBA or being a rock star, yeah, um, I I never really thought about doing anything different than being a mathematician. You had serious applica uh, um, uh, ambitions to become a rock musician. What, oh. would you, what was your instrument? What was your? <laughs> where you play the? You know the. the uh, uh, I may be joking. Right? Well, uh -huh. well, uh, well, yes and yeah. no. I mean, I, I, I was uh, when I was in college. I, I was, I was a vocalist in a band. And, really? Uh, yeah, but uh, we were. But I, I knew that I would have to have a day job, <laughs> and so, so yeah. I thought mathematics was as good as any. It so. is, and you said to me, there's a couple of traditions in math. Mathematics underscores so much of science and of the intellectual process in real terms, and particularly all the cyber things that are built out of mathematics. Right. You said there are a couple of traditions or views or takes on mathematics. One would be more artistic, one would be more scientific. I wonder yes. if you could touch on that briefly, because mathematics underscores so much of what's going on in terms of the advancement of technology and so forth. Uh, yes, it, it uh, does, and, and so I think these, these, two, um, these two strains that you just mentioned have, um, have been discussed and, and have existed uh, really going back to the Greeks, really, and, and, uh -huh. uh, and uh, they come into uh, contact with each other by, by sometimes what, like, uh, for um, example, Eugene Wigner called the, the, um, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics um, uh -huh. in that um, even mathematics that, um, that looks very abstruse and, uh, mm -hmm. and very theoretical and that doesn't seem to be connected to anything at all mm -hmm. um, can turn out to be absolutely crucial in, uh, in the description of natural phenomena 
for what you mentioned, cybersecurity, where number theory plays a, yeah, a big role. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, and um, so, and w when you see these two things come together, it is really fascinating um, how how they play together and um, how they make for such great results. I did a program on an occasion with Michel Cockle, the theoretical, and he said that when, when a, uh, a conductor sees a score and he's directing it, he sees a whole pattern of beauty or ugly. You right. know, you can see, same with mathematicians. Mathematicians can see a, a, a uh, you know, a form, uh, a, a theorem or a, or a pattern that is uh, pleasing or not by looking at it as though you're seeing, you're seeing something that is not just a lot of things on paper. It has a beauty or an elegance in itself that is pleasing and they can see that. Right. Whereas somebody looking at it wouldn't know what to do. It's a bunch of X's and Y's and so forth. But that's, that's true. You see a pattern when you look at a good uh, form, uh, you know, uh, pattern of uh, putting a mathematical thought together. Well, that and, and, and I think also that when that pattern, when it tells you something that you didn't expect, yeah, that makes it even more beautiful. And uh, so I, I uh, and creative, right? Yeah, right. And Absolutely. It's so, well, congratulations on that. And well, then you've you. been teaching at universities, and now you've taken on uh, the role. You're a, a, a mathematician, but you're also the dean of the arts and science for this uh, major institution. That's you right. have spent a good deal of time in Southern California, University of Southern California, Arizona State, and your resume goes on like <laughs> it's really uh, amazing how much work you've done, reading papers and plenary sessions and so forth. But you've moved to Detroit, and you have had to become aware of it, and Detroit's been going through a great deal that's been very much in the news of late over the last sure decade or two. So sure. maybe we could talk a little bit about the city of Detroit that you've adopted as a place to be now, right. because it's uh, the fate of Detroit or the situation in Detroit is very much in the national and international news, is absolutely. it not? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, yes, so um, when I was um, considering coming um, to Detroit, um, I think frankly many people thought I, I was crazy. Yeah. But I, I've lived in many places, and um, I'm very flexible about where I would consider living. And I looked at Detroit, at, at the good, mm -hmm. at the bad, mm -hmm. at the ugly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, um, but I saw many good things. Um, for example, the, um, the uh, Detroit Institute of Arts is, is, is one of the best art museums in, in the, the world, US. yes, yeah. In, Diego in, Rivera, it, yes, it, it, that's a treasure. Yes, uh huh. Mm. Um, and um, and uh, Detroit, I'm I'm a big sports fan, and uh, mm. Detroit is a great sports town. I yeah. I really love the sports in Detroit, mm -hmm. and I I think back to when I was a little kid in um, in uh, for example the, the you know the 1968 World Series that yeah. uh, Detroit won with Al Kaline. Yeah, and uh, and mm -hmm. um, so I, I was. Uh, I'm very pleased. I'm a big hockey fan, and mm -hmm. uh, the Detroit Red Wings have been the best team in uh, the National Hockey League over the last 25 years. You still have the Olympia Stadium? Do you say? Uh, or did that, that get torn down? That's well. That's now part of Cobo. Oh, they've got yeah. a new complex. Yeah. Right, uh, and, uh, and and now they have Joe Lewis Arena. Yeah, right. Um, Joe Lewis was a Detroit fellow. Yeah. Right. That's right. And yeah. then uh, there there's now a plan, and maybe we can talk about this in in greater detail uh. to to build a new arena for the Red Wings. That, uh, that will be part of a huge development that's called the district. Now we spoke about the beautiful and the ugly. There's been a great deal over the last decade or so that could only be seen in ugly terms in the normal way of seeing things. Is that right? They've had great difficulty and they had to declare, I think it's the largest city ever, bankruptcy as a city and a going concern. And maybe we could that, address that because that's been very much in the news with sure. a lot of uh, disparaging mark, remarks made about the difficulties that Sure. encountered their their develop their situation. Well, I can tell you what what was a poignant moment for me, which is when um, uh, just as I arrived at, at Wayne State University in the fall of, of 2012, we were doing a, a search for a new president of the university, mm -hmm. and I I was asked to be a member of the search committee, and mm -hmm. and I I was very pleased and very sure. honored to have been chosen to do that. Mm. So when we went to conduct our first interviews at Detroit Airport, they're, mm. they're sometimes called airport interviews, where we bring in about ten people. Mm. It's all very hush hush and <laughs> and you know very confidential. Yeah. Um, and just the in the in the few days before, um, former Mayor uh, Kwame Kilpatrick had been convicted of corruption <laughs> charges. Yes. And 
the city had gone into bankruptcy. <laughs> so we, we are holed up at the Mel Westin. Mel Brooks could do wonders with the yeah. comedy movie. Yes, yeah, yes, right. I, I, but uh, it was serious, yes. Uh -huh. It was, it was. You really, 18 billion, was it? In, in, about in, that, depending on, you know, how, how you count, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, and so we were sitting uh, in a room in the Westin Hotel at Detroit Airport, and uh. there's about 25 of us on this committee. Yeah. And we're looking at each other saying, <laughs> how are we going to get anyone to take this job? <laughs> yes. but, but, I, uh, but I think that this illustrates the, the allure of Detroit, even at, at that very low moment, uh -huh. in that we had, uh, I can't name them because the, uh, that would be inappropriate, but mm -hmm. we had, um, for that first round, we had 10 just fabulous candidates really? uh -huh. come, and I could tell by the way they spoke how, how interested they were. Uh -huh. They knew what was going on. Uh -huh. They knew the bad. They knew the ugly. They, they knew the good. They yeah. knew, they knew the ugly. Uh -huh. but and they, they were, knew the good potential that we're going to be talking about a little later. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. They yeah. were uh, they were very and uh, and I think that 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 you know after those two days of interviews, and we saw um, how interested they were in this position. That that I think it gave us hope um, for the city um, t to you know to see the way uh, that outsiders, m most of whom had had little previous contact with the university. Right, right. Felt about it. Well, um, there is the university. We're going to be talking about that because right. the university is an intrinsic part, particularly of downtown Detroit. You right. know, the heart of Detroit, Absolutely. which has suffered dearly because the. Uh, I think they were the first in the hearts of whatever they built the uh, interstate highway system, which was an escape to, uh, exur uh, you know, suburban living and so right. forth, which is a accompanied the whole world in a very real sense. That's and so what had been the downtown area became uh, under great difficulty and uh, they had to go and uh, declare bankruptcy. That's correct, yes. Which is pretty serious. I mean, it is. I think it's the largest city to do that in the country. It is, I, th I think, by quite a margin. and um, By quite a margin, margin even, some, yes. Uh -huh. uh, but I think that the way in which the bankruptcy was handled by, by the creditors, by by the judges, by by uh, by the retirees, um, was was just incredible. I, I I've never seen anything like it in my life. The so-called grand bargain. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was really if uh, and uh, it showed people that you know there was hope uh, for humanity. Uh, yeah. Big, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I was just saying it could be a metaphor for the planet Earth, possibly if you see things in a certain way. I think so. It could be a metaphor of, uh, of coming up against a system that's untenable. How are we going to deal with it? How are we going to incorporate it? How are we going to reify institutions? How are we going to put a thing together? And Detroit was, could, could be seen as an extreme model, and there was a great deal of suffering by a lot of people when the economy had such difficulty. So it was a major problem confronting it, and it seems to me very interesting. If I could, we got a clip that we want to show. Sure. And uh, I can remember when Mr. Obama was was uh, just coming into office. One of the first things that he had the wit and wisdom to deal with amidst all of the meltdown of the economy that could be seen as a, a major blow. The depression of the 1930s was a major blow. So these are things like that. But he had the wit and wisdom to um, undercut uh, or to supply support, uh, life support maybe, for the automobile industry, right. which was threatened of going completely under. And he had the wisdom to do that. Right. And I think he should be applauded for that because it, there were people taking notice that this is too large a thing to let just go into debtorous or something along those lines. Yes. Um, um, well, I think that um, it was estimated that something like one in seven jobs in the country depended in some part on the auto industry. It did. Um, in the golden days, it was magnificent. In um, the days, uh, I think it had the highest income uh, per capita income in the nation along about, um, you know, when the automobile was, uh, was so much a part of the national economy. I think it had the lar highest per capita income and it went to where there was a great deal of difficulty when when you came aboard or when the the, right. the, the immediate future uh, the immediate situation was uh, borning yeah that's right and um, so I think that um, while we're not here to you know as you know, much to talk about politics but um, but but I think that if um, if uh, the auto industries had had just um, collapsed 
had just completely collapsed. The, the, the whole region, the, the, there, there, there were a lot of auto parts companies right. uh -huh. that, that would have been ruined, and I think it, it would have left a gaping hole in a big part of the country. Absolutely, and the uh -huh. nation took notice, at least the responsible nation. There was a lot uh -huh. of naysaying and saying, uh, you know, a blame, uh, finger pointing and all that sort of thing. Right. I, I'd suggested that there was a clip that uh, came up. It's actually the news hour, you know, the, the news hour had a mm -hmm. clip who relates to that because uh, that is, um, that, that relates to that issue about five minutes or so. I think this might be a good time to play that clip. Sure. And then uh, we're talking with uh, Dean of Arts and Sciences for Wayne State University in Detroit, uh, Wayne uh, Raskin. So maybe we could roll that tape, uh, a news hour clip about the city of Detroit over the last year or two. Okay, Nearly 16 months after Detroit filed for bankruptcy, a federal judge approved an unprecedented and complex plan today that would bring the city out of bankruptcy and is designed to give it a fresh start. The plan allows Detroit to shed $7 billion of debt, reinvest more than a billion dollars into neglected public services, cut pensions of general city retirees, and cut payments to bondholders. Hari Srinivasan has more on the story. One crucial component of the plan that came together in the past few months is the so-called grand bargain. It allows the city to accept more than $800 million from nonprofit foundations, the state and others over two decades. That deal protects the city from selling a noted art collection at the Detroit Institute of Arts and reduces the size of pension cuts. The Ford Foundation has donated the most money to the grand bargain, $125 million in all. Its president, Darren Walker, joins me now. Thanks for being with us. So my first question is, what are nonprofit foundations doing in what seems like a bankruptcy bailout? Well, we're not in the business of solving bankruptcies, but we do solve big problems and work with leaders at the city level and the community level, public and private sectors, to help solve community problems. And this is one example of a group of foundations coming together at the behest of Judge Gerald Rosen to help solve this challenge. So is this a template for other cities that might be in financial straits? This is not a template for other cities, but there are many lessons here. This was a complicated $20 billion bankruptcy with thousands of creditors and many contested issues. But our focus, which was on saving the Detroit Institute of the Arts and ameliorating the situation for the workers of the city, particularly those retirees under the pension fund, were, that was what we were able to help accomplish. But this it doesn't mean that other cities are going to look to foundations to solve their bankruptcy issues. This is not a template for that. So you mentioned the Detroit Institute for the Arts. One of the concerns is, is why doesn't the DIA sell some of this artwork uh, to help Detroit get back on its feet, especially when bondholders, investors, even pensioners are all taking haircuts or tightening their belts? Well, every great American city has a great cultural institution, and the DIA is one of America's greatest treasures. It's unthinkable to imagine a future for Detroit without the DIA. So what would this money allow the city to do? The judge had some tough criticism of what the city's not doing well right now. He, in, in certain parts, he's, he says the problems run deep, have for years, and some of it is inhumane and intolerable. Do, does this consortium of foundations agree that a lot more needs to be done? Absolutely a lot, a lot more needs to be done, Hari, but it's important to keep our eye on the prize. Detroit is now back in the starting blocks. It is positioned well for a great future. There is uptick in employment, small business development. Many of the indicators of economic and community well-being are improving. The question now is, what does the future hold for Detroit? And we believe the future is very bright. So while this does close one particular chapter or nearing closing a chapter, it kind of opens another section for Detroit's life in the next 10 or 20 years. And what are the foundations looking for as these indicators that you started to tick off that the city is on the right path? You're not writing an, an unconditional check for 10 to 20 years, are you? Absolutely not. We were clear that our resources would be used to secure the pensions and secure the museum's collection. But we are investing in its future in the civic grid. Democracy needs to work in Detroit. 
And in order for that to happen, we need to invest in civic organizations, in cultural organizations, in health and well-being, and of course in education. All of the foundations who are engaged in the grand bargain are deeply committed to investing in those areas. It's going to be essential for the future of the city. So while we're talking mostly about Detroit's financial struggles, there are underlying challenges about race and class. What do you think something like this grand bargain, like this solution, does to begin addressing those deeper problems that the city might have? Well, Detroit sits at the narrative of the American city. And as in many American cities, there are challenges around racial issues, and we can't we can't put under the rug the fact that Detroit has been challenged for decades around racial issues. The city and the region must come together to solve their problems collectively. But in order to do that, the city must have great leadership. We're all encouraged and looking forward to a new mayor, a new city council who are engaged and eager to take up the helm. So we're excited at the Ford Foundation to support this effort. So Ten years from now, best case scenario, it goes as you envision. Well, what are we here talking about, about Detroit? What we talk about is a vibrant city with a growing population, an inclusive economy, schools that deliver quality education, a transportation system bounded by the new M1 line, and a recognition that in order for Detroit to be sustainable, we have to invest in its institutions and in its people. And how do you instill a sense of culture, or I should say, perhaps inject energy into the culture that already exists in Detroit? Because some people say, well, this is a great plan. It kind of was cooked up by a lot of non-Detroiters. Well, in fact, the Ford Foundation has been in Detroit since 1936, when we were founded by Edsel and Henry Ford. But the bottom line for Detroit's future is that the local people do have to control its narrative and its future. But this doesn't mean pitting incumbent residents against new residents. Any vibrant great city always has new people coming, but it also invests in incumbent residents. And so the understanding of the tension is reasonable between the many new residents, residents who are moving to Detroit and longtime leaders who have felt the results of disinvestment and who are a little <laughs> beleaguered by it. All right, Darren Walker, president of the Ford Foundation, thanks so much for your time. Happy to be here. Thank you. Holly. Okay, that's pretty easy. He summed up a great deal. And Ford sure Foundation is a giant and so forth. And it's good that he, along with the insight of Mr. Obama, I'd like to go back to some years before, uh, has helped to look at the situation in Detroit. And uh, it's, a, it's a harbinger uh, life support or something, but it's a, a thing that's going to build into a new future that we maybe can talk about. Uh, just a little bit down the line, but there was a great deal of difficulty faced by a great number of people in Detroit. Buildings abandoned, unemployment, racial strife. There's a high percentage of African American there with racial thing, even though they did have the Motown thing that helped and the cultural things. But a great deal of difficulties that were in, uh, were uh, attended upon. A huge loss of population. People had the feeling that when well, you're born in Detroit, you go somewhere else if you want to be successful. All of these kind of things were part of the context that had been roiling the city before you came, and you had to have been aware of that. And I think the political or the, the, the leadership element of, of, of the United States understands all of that as well. But maybe it's worthwhile just keeping that in mind as we talk about the situation as you arrive. There's a great deal of abandoned buildings. People are scrapping uh, copper uh, in uh, Eight Mile Road, M and N, all this kind of thing. Uh, the thing. So that's a situation that was there. And um, so, uh, against that background, I wonder: do, do you more or less you recognized all that as you contemplated coming to this place that so much of the society was um, giving a very bad reputation to? I certainly did, um, but but I think in in the role that I was going to play at Wayne State University, yeah. I embraced that challenge um, because I I think that and and perhaps we'll talk about this later that yeah. uh, that education is a, a key piece of uh, uh, of addressing this challenge, mm -hmm. and um, f and, and um, so I really <coughs> thought uh, that 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 I could make a difference um, in my position, and I've been very. 
I've been trying very hard to do that. Yeah, well, as an alumni of, uh, of Wayne, I took my bachelor's and master's degree there, taught there, so I got a warm feeling and have family roots to go back to the 19th century to Detroit. I was very sensitive to that and everything, so I read that very, uh, very, very carefully. And then uh, all of that, uh, I'm wondering, uh, it, 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 the, the, the Wayne University, we want to talk in great depth maybe in the second part of this overall program, but um, it's right in the center on Woodward Avenue in the center of downtown. A lot right. of uh, the trend has been in urban development. People go to the suburbs, uh, you know, right. uh, lo local uh, uh, dispersed uh, economic activity and so forth. But Detroit, uh, the uh, Wayne State University is right in the center of it, uh, and the, Depart the uh, Detroit Institute of Art with those magnificent murals that Diego Rivera did back in the 30s and so right. forth. It's got one of the greatest art collections in the world. Right. And I was here glad to say that the, the Ford Foundation helped to, verify, to save that collection against uh, raiding by people who would want to, you know, that, so that's all very good. Um, but there is a lot of abandoned buildings. And so what kind of a situation does that mean in terms of the rebirth or the renaissance of the city as we can begin to see it? Uh, there's a lot of property, there's a lot of uh, property available at sure. relatively uh, competitive terms and uh, prices, low yes. price because of the, the, the disaster that had been uh, bedeviling so many people. And still, there's still people that way. But that makes for an environment that can be very encouraging for, um, well, let's say an entrepreneurial class or people who might me might be moving, even as we re as that might be developing, and it seems to be it is, uh, also keeping in mind that it also had to in involve the incumbent population of the city. But um, what do you think are the prospects for, what are the advantages of the fact that there was an environment created that is it, seeming disastrous, but might be hopeful in, in, in a future tense. Well, I think that um, uh, that in a, a glass half full yeah. um, kind of philosophy, that that there is the opportunity to really build something new. Mm -hmm. And I think for that to happen, I think that um, that uh, the city needs more jobs for its current residents, and um, and then it 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 needs to grow its population. I think it's clear that for a city of 139 square miles, mm -hmm. uh, that it's a lot to care for. Uh, mm -hmm. the, as you mentioned, there were many abandoned structures. I think there's something like 80,000 abandoned structures That's in Detroit. That's amazing, yeah. Uh, and, and so really, I think everyone agrees that the city needs more, more people, and yet the people living in the city need to be served better than they have been, but that can't happen unless there are enough enough people paying taxes to support the services that everyone needs. Right. And, and um, so, so it's kind of a, it's a bit of a chicken and egg yes. um, thing. And, um, and Governor Rick Snyder mm -hmm. of Michigan has suggested uh, bringing in immigrants. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that would be wonderful, but I think that, that we could bring in, if you will, immigrants from other parts of, of the United States. Thank uh, you. Mm -hmm. um, there are about 310 million people who live in the U.S but not in Michigan. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that there is, um, that, that for certain of those people, that, that actually, um, that Detroit can be a very attractive place for them to pursue their dreams and hopes. Yeah, it could well be. And it's often from the, uh, from the uh, debtors of destruction emerge new opportunities that people can see in an advantageous way. And what I understand from having been in touch with a whole lot of uh, people, uh, there's beginning to be a great deal of attention given to the city and the opportunities that are inherent in the situation, recognizing the difficulties, uh, particularly among some of the, uh, what is called the entrepreneurial right. or the web designers and people of right. that order, some of the younger people that can see, uh, they may be all gathered in K Street in New York or, or New York or in uh, 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 you know, Silicon Valley or Palo Alto or something like that. They're there in great multitudes and so forth. And as I understand, I like to keep my ear to the ground for some of the things. There's a whole lot of interest happening in terms of the entrepreneurial class seeing Detroit 
as the place from which the resurrection and the movement forward, things cyber and so forth, is going to find the focus. That is correct, and and I think that there is um, increasing crossover between uh, that entrepreneurial class of people and some of the traditional industries there, such as the auto industry. Yes, indeed. As as the auto industry is is transformed um, almost into uh, an electronics industry, be, yeah. because so much of a car now is electronic. It's all yeah, um, and, and that's all based on mathematics. I think all of that cyber stuff is based upon the work of our great mathematicians, Mr. Raskin. It all <laughs> all comes back to mathematics. Yeah. Really, uh, and, you can take it from me. So oh, and science and the, so forth. Yeah, that's correct. And um, and I think that with um, that the um, uh, that uh, the average fuel economy standards, yes. uh, which which have you know been uh, becoming stricter. Um, that they are really forcing auto companies and others to come up with some new ideas mm -hmm. for more fuel efficient cars. Yes, for global warming is becoming more and more being aware of the national and international con uh, consciousness. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and so I think that um, between that and also some light manufacturing you see, for example, like Shinola Watch Company has, has um, has set up shop in Detroit. I, Have I, they? Okay. Yeah. I believe they used to make bicycles. Yeah. Okay. Back uh -huh. when you were a kid. Um, yeah. And uh, and and they have a shop that's just down down the street from Wayne State. They they really? sell inside in, in the inner city. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. Yes. It's it, yeah. It's just probably half a mile from from a Wayne State University. Yeah, yeah. And they sell uh, they they sell pretty high end watches uh -huh. uh, that are manufactured right there. And, and so, you got you got a labor base that can be drawn upon, right? Oh, absolutely. A lot of skilled labor, a lot of engineers and people that are skilled from the auto industry and so forth. There's That's a correct. lot of well-educated as well as other people who could be doing uh, jobs in a normal kind of way. That more, you know what I'm saying? That's correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and and so I think everyone realizes that uh, they have to do something different. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's important in and of itself. It if is. you're too comfortably ensconced within a situation, it doesn't make, often it doesn't make for innovation, which is needed. Right. Do you That's understand? Good. In a large yeah. metaphor for maybe the world, for that matter, if you can understand. You got to go through a difficult time in order to get to the new thing often okay. as a societal movement. You know? That's correct. And, and I think if there's a metaphor for what is happening in Detroit these days, it, it is lighting. So uh -huh. I think going back about 40 years and in probably as of two or three years ago, I think something like 60 percent of the streetlights in, in Detroit were inoperative. Oh. And so there were a lot of neighborhoods that were essentially dark. Uh -huh. and, That's and, not good, yeah. And um, now uh, with new LED lighting, mm -hmm. um, there is what's called the Detroit Lighting Authority. Mm -hmm. And they are um, way ahead of their goal to to quite literally light up the city again. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Edison, yes. Um, yeah, yeah. And I was just, um, when I was coming from the airport um, a few weeks ago and, and, um, and making the transition from Interstate 94 to Interstate 75, mm -hmm. there was a particularly dark um, patch. Uh, yeah, there, and um, I was driving on it. it. It was at night and I was looking up and I and I asked myself, what is right with this picture? Uh -huh. And it was lit up with, with, uh, with beautiful L and efficient LED light. Good, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, um, efficient, yeah. New efficiencies found because we had to have them, right. Or because it right. was an opportunity that's presenting to us to take advantage of the advancements of science and all those mathematicians behind science. That's right, and, <laughs> and, and because there, there's so much less electricity, Required that there's not as much copper that's wire. Right. That's right. And, and so the pillage of copper wire has decreased considerably yeah. in Detroit. And um, it is just lighting up the city in a way that it has not seen in at least 40 years. And Wonderful. It's, that's it's, with the local population, of which is a great pool of t good talent, good engineering, and so on. And also, I'm getting word from the entrepreneurs. Right. And I, 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 we have another clip that we thought we could add here. Please. And it's from, uh, I think, Campbell Ewald, if, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, an offshoot of that. But it's a young, young people, the 20s, 30s, that sort of thing, right. uh, talking about Detroit as a mecca of attention by some of our brightest people yes. who are a little bit uh, uh, not impressed by the slow pace of things where there's an over 
uh, abundance of people at some of the places we think of, like Palo Alto and Silicon Valley and Washington, K Street, and that sort of thing. They're looking at Detroit as the place to be right. in a creative and leading edge entrepreneurial sense. That's correct. And we have a little clip uh, that we could maybe show now of that uh, with some of the people talking about Detroit. Detroit is the place to be. Right. And it seems a little uh, counterintuitive, but it might be part of a broader reality. So maybe we could run that tape now then um, if we could. When you combine friendship plus tools, you can make anything. Bree Pattis did that in his New York City loft. Welcome to my loft. My name is Ian Lanovich, creative director at Low Campbell Ewald. In early 2014, we're moving over 600 employees into the heart of the city of Detroit. I can't tell you exactly what Detroit's gonna be like by the time I give you this presentation, but I can tell you one thing for sure. It's not gonna be the way it was. Whether you're a designer, an innovator, an entrepreneur, or an investor, you're in this business to create, to help a cause, or maybe just simplify one's life. But in Detroit, you have the opportunity not just to make your product, but to define the city's future. Meet Kevin Kreese and Garrett Kohler, two guys who created and led a social media field movement that brought the creative community of Detroit together, showcasing its unselfish spirit and endless motivation. So guys, why Detroit? The whole city is an opportunity in and of itself because you have other cities that are developed, mature, highly competitive, lots of people, um, you know, everyone's scrambling for entry-level positions. Versus in Detroit, you can just create what you want to do here and that there's such an appetite, an audience, that you could start a restaurant, you could start anything, a new business, a website, an app, and you have huge clients and huge, huge customer base that you can sell to. Detroit's often a vanguard city, so everyone's watching how we deal with bankruptcy and how we deal with all of these problems and these issues. And so if you want to come to Detroit and change things and be a part of, of that vanguard movement that's going to speak for the rest of the nation and what, what happens, um, you would come to Detroit. So what did you guys learn about the people of Detroit? You have to be real enough to live here. There's like a, a tremendous amount of value and authenticity. Um, and if, if they think you're being disingenuous, you know, they, they might not be as willing to help you out on your project. But if, if they get that you're here to stay in Detroit and work in Detroit, you'll never find uh, a place with so much support from, from peers, from people who aren't peers, from executives, you know? People need to see Detroit succeed um, to sort of have faith in the American story. So when, when you see positive things happening here, you want to support it. Whether you're into making movements, making movies, or making apps, the talent is moving to Detroit. Henry Bellinon is on his third mobile app startup in less than six years, two of which were founded in Detroit. He plans to move his latest project there sometime in the near future. The best thing about working in Detroit is actually seeing it grow. So actually seeing it from what it was a year or two ago is completely different than what it is now. Being in a startup is no longer scary in this area. So from the first business to now, uh, it's a lot easier because other people have done it to, to bring people into, into the startup world. People see bankruptcy as this, this really awful thing, right? But it's really a restructuring thing. There's so many people here who are fans of Detroit. Things are gonna get fixed. They already started doing that in the private sector with Dan Gilbert buying up buildings and bringing businesses down there. Uh, now we do gotta do it in the public sector too. I think in our lifetime, we're gonna see a complete turnaround and I'm gonna be here when that happens. So there you have it. We're moving to Detroit and so should you. Why? So we can create friendships, combine our tools with those around us and make, well, anything. Does it bother us that Detroit went bankrupt? Not really. What matters is that it's rich in creativity, innovation, and inspiration. So come join us in defining the future of Detroit. Okay, that's exciting. I mean, that see, that's an entrepreneurial spirit. And I hear a lot of people are, are, are casting their eye toward Detroit now. A lot of the entrepreneurial creative edge uh, young people and others that are in association with that entrepreneurial spirit. Hmm? 
That's correct, yes. Uh, and you can see this, um, for example, with food. Um, so um, Detroit in 2010 was r really what's sometimes called a, a food desert. There were the, the, the last supermarket chain, uh, the last national supermarket chain, um, Farmer Jack's, had abandoned Detroit, uh -huh. uh, I believe, in 2007. Mm -hmm. And it, it was really difficult for, for residents to, to get quality food at affordable prices. Mm -hmm. And um, then, then started about, about 10 years ago, there was uh, a big movement with, um, uh, with, with produce that, that's grown in Detroit. They're, they're, they actually, can, the Detroit is so large, they, they actually have urban gardens and things going, I think, which is part, part of the, uh, the movement, as it is by the younger people, their perceptions ecologically motivated and so forth. They do, yeah. and then uh, there, there, are, there are two things. One is, is that a, a lot uh, um, um, of restaurateurs um, came to Detroit and, uh, and they opened new restaurants, a lot of edgy yeah. and very creative new restaurants. Um, and um, so from being a food desert, actually, Detroit is, is becoming a food mecca. And then in um, about two years ago, um, Whole Foods Market opened up. Whole Foods is there now, yeah. In huh? Detroit. Mm -hmm. And everyone wondered why, uh, I mean, why would Whole, why would Whole Foods come yeah. to Detroit mm -hmm. with, uh, I think, the average family income of, of a Whole Foods um, customer is something like $120,000 a year. Yeah, right. Which yeah. is... Uh, and um, but Whole Foods, um, uh, they um, they were very clear, they, and um, and and so that they've opened up at Cass Avenue and Mac. Oh yeah, yeah, I, and, I can remember. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, and mm. they have been they they've been extremely successful. And um, then Meyer, which which is a big supermarket chain in Michigan, mm -hmm. opened up a big um, a big shopping center near uh, the state fairgrounds, uh, um, uh -huh. about eight mile. They used to have a racetrack out there, didn't they? That's correct, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, that has been extremely successful. And now, now Meyer is thinking, I, I think, about building another one in, in northwest Detroit. Mm -hmm. And so um, a lot of national corporations that, that had abandoned Detroit mm -hmm. over the last 50 years are, are now seem to be falling all over themselves to come back. Yeah. Uh, and, um, but, but it is not charity. I, I, I think they, they see, I, I mean, a, a real opportunity. Yeah. To invest in the city, to right. you know, to provide hopefully good services, yes. but you know, to also make some money. Um, yeah, right, right, right. The, yeah, that's right. And and don't don't forget, we also had uh, you, you you could entertainment. I mean, you had Motown. That was a major right. thing in terms of the city of Detroit, the Motown movement, right. and the music that came out of there. And right. there's cultural possibilities that come along with the development. Right. And so that's something that's very encouraging, and that and that. And one wants to try and back up again and see this in a historical context, the development, uh, the, the, the rise and, uh, Gibbon wrote, uh, the rise and fall of the uh, Roman Empire right. and so forth, and to see it in historical terms, um, the meaning of things that have precedent for other, uh, a metaphor for other movements or other areas, not only of... Uh, Detroit or Michigan or the you know the, the, the upper middle west or, uh, but uh, for the nation mm -hmm. and that um, um, that's something it because what's going on now in the nation and in the country the 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 link between Wayne State University is a major anchoring const, uh, cultural institution educational constitution in the heart of Detroit with all of these changes that are going on is a uh, story that has, could have relevance elsewhere mm. and particular relevance of that uh, uniqueness of that. It's like uh, the, 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 an understanding of the movement of the society writ large. There are larger lessons other than the immediate ones that we can call to attention and so forth that of the Detroit story. It may be mo far more significant than people tend to give a credit to. Seeing I think it, it in normal terms, like it, if you understand what I'm trying to say, I think it is, and and I think that um, that it it is known that since about the year 2000, that that people have have been returning to cities, uh -huh. <coughs> and um, and uh, this is true worldwide, really. Uh -huh. And um, I've I've seen other cities where I've lived for. Um, Example like Los Angeles, yeah. which which went through a difficult time, yeah. even as I was moving there in uh, the early 1990s, yeah. and um, but 
improvements in infrastructure, uh, public transportation, uh, and um, that uh, it is a city that, even since I left there in 2008, has really improved a lot. Um, a L.A., yes. the, base, the whole thing, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. L.A., um, so the, the joke used to be um, in L.A. that the only thing you could not do in L.A. was to get mugged in the subway because there was no subway. Um, but but, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. but uh, then they built a subway in, in, in the early to mid-1990s. They have a subway in L.A.? They do. It, it, it's not nearly as extensive as that in New York. Well, New York subway is just a phenomenon. I mean, you don't it even is. need an, You don't need to have an automobile to live in Manhattan. No, you don't. It's a hindrance, actually. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. Um, but I think L.A. Um, I think realized in about the early 90s that they had gone as far as as they can go with a car, uh -huh. and that uh, the traffic there was was, was oh. so challenging. Yeah. Um, that they you know they really needed to to do something else, but they found um, the people really appreciated um, having you know solid, reliable, and affordable public transportation. Yeah. And um, I've certainly been a big fan of it from my time in in European cities and in Japan. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, and I think that um, among millennials um, in particular, there is a real movement towards public transportation. Yeah. And I think that um, that uh, Detroit was an extreme case of yeah. how it came to a low. But I think other cities such as Cleveland have been facing some of these same challenges. Yeah, and following in the mile. Yeah, and and we have a uh, or there's a uh, we have a, a fellow uh, colleague at uh, at Wayne, uh, Jerry, you know Jerry, um, 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 oh Jerry, uh, Jerry Heron. Heron, yes, yes of course. Jerry, I've had Jerry, great conversations. He's a great guy, right. and he writes yes. like a demon, or yeah. like a really gr uh, good yeah. writing and. Right. It quotes, it thinks in terms of things in a large sociological and con historical right. context. And um, he's written a great deal. He's, he's the dean of the Irving Honors Program at Wayne, right? That's right. And he's Irving a writer. Honors College, yes. Honors College, yes. yeah. And he's written, and he, uh, uh, he's taking a historical perspective because it was a major change. And he cites uh, Gibbon when he talks about the people coming 300 years after the fall of Rome uh, being uh, not aware. And he, he, he underscores it. And he, he gave a little talk. And uh, we have that on tape. And I think maybe this might be a good time to set up trying to put this all, the historical, the, the, the thing with Wayne, uh, Detroit, into a historical context. And uh, I'm wondering, maybe if it were five minutes or so, as an introduction, and he sets a sort of radical premise that could really be, he said Detroit is the most important city in the world to get an understanding of the historical process by which planet Earth is operating, something along those lines. So uh, that might be an interesting theme that we'd be able to do. So we got about a five minute clip, he's actually reading from a paper but I think it might be a good time to sort of set that up to get a historical underpinning of understanding Detroit and something other than the negative terms that so much of the news has been. So maybe we could run that tape with, uh, with Jerry Heron, uh, PhD and uh, phil uh, historical philosopher, as it were. Okay, let's run that tape now then, please. Jerry will be talking about his new book, the culmination of many years of both research and contemplation, uh, which he has so nicely entitled, Living with Detroit, an all-purpose history of America. Uh, Professor Jerry Heron, the dean of the Irvin D. Reed Honors College here at Wayne State University. Thank you, Mark, for that very kind and very generous introduction. Uh, like you said, no pressure. Uh, <laughs> here's, what Mark, uh, here's what I said to Mark. I said, how about this? If instead of giving a lecture, uh, how about if I provide a reading? Uh, a reading from this book of interconnected essays that's titled Living with Detroit. And on your behalf, Mark kindly said, OK. So that's what you're going to get. Uh, not a lecture, but a reading. 
And I'll start this reading by letting the cat out of the bag right away. Here's my big fat thesis. Detroit is the most American place on planet Earth. Anything that makes us who we are has gone further, faster here, happened first, more of it first here than any place else on the planet. Period. That's it, right? So Detroit is the complete monitor and comprehensive device for understanding who Americans are. Now, one central thing about us as a people is it's a kind of rocket ride up and down. Americans were relatively slow in terms of other developed industrial societies in becoming urban. We didn't do it until the 1920 census. By the 1950 census, the city had peaked as its kind of device of destination. By 1970, we had become the first suburban people in the history of humans on the surface of this planet. Now, if you, you got that rocket ride up and down? We're not doing visual aids today. This is it. Uh, this is as good as it gets. So the rocket up and down, that demographic climb toward the city at its peak, and then almost immediately, we didn't settle down. We bailed instantly when we built the cities up. Detroit is an exaggerated version of that. That's my claim. Whatever it is that makes us who we are, how we use cities, what we do with cities, we've done more of it faster here in Detroit. And especially, we've done more of this distinctively American thing. Unlike other cultures, we came to the city, did whatever we did in the city, and then left later that same day. So if you want to understand us as a people, the distinctive thing that makes us who we are is this distinctive, weird, unusual, unexpected way that we've used cities. And Detroit, back to my thesis, is the most representative city of all. So if you want to understand citizens, Americans, anything connected with us as a culture, you're at the very navel of where that happens, Detroit. Okay, so now you know the big thesis. It's out of the bag. This is going to help you keep track. I always like to know where we are. We're going to move from denial to hope. Those are the pieces of the essays that I'm going to be reading. So we're going to start with denial. Here we go. Detroit is not just a city, it's a revelation. The most fully revealed sight we have as Americans of who we are and what we have done to ourselves and to others. It's a heroic place and a place that will break your heart just like us, profligate and generous and open-hearted and dangerous and wasteful and mean and, in the end, hopeful, in a way that only people who've been through something hard together might lay claim to a hope that is precious because it is so dearly purchased, although it's not often these days that we allow ourselves the luxury of hope as anything more than a private affair in Detroit or any place else. And now that's worth remembering. Now, if we could learn to live with Detroit then, we might come finally to understand ourselves and what is perhaps more important, to accept who we are, all of us, together, in the faith that with understanding comes the possibility for change. But being who we are, with the myriad improbable chances afforded to us by this continent that we appropriated for our private use, Americans have made a history based not on memory but on forgetting, because that's what this abundant place has let us do and taught us to believe in. We want to live in the present. Henry Ford said, famously summing things up, and that's what we've been doing right along, because the place allowed us to. Centuries before Ford's fortuitous formulation, it has allowed us to forget about the past so as to keep the present always clear of unwanted debris. And it's not just forgetting the past itself that I'm talking about, not even primarily that. Facts or places or names or where we came from or what might have gone on here before we arrived or who the land belonged to first that we took it away from. No, we've forgotten how to remember the past, which is a more complicated business altogether. How to pose the kinds of questions that call memory into witness. We are exceptional and gifted with possibilities uniquely ours because of where we are and what we have become. A designer people, not a people of history. And Detroit was the engine that produced the wealth that made our designer dreams come true. A way of seeing, not just the city anymore. So our good luck freed us of any backward looking obligations until the design failed. No more arsenal of democracy, which Detroit really was, and not just in wars, but in peacetime too. The place you could come to that would not only take you in, but make you rich beyond any working man's or woman's wildest dreams. And everybody else got rich too, in terms both real and symbolic. This really was the heartbeat of America, like those bygone Chevy commercials used to say, celebrating the cars that stood so adamantly for a dream come true in Detroit and for a democratic promise made real here. But that was then. Now Detroit is the future that the rest of America would like to abandon here, a bankrupt future bound up with race and violence and economic strife, a place to blame for making us believe and then abandoning us when we needed most to believe in something so that everybody wants not to be from Detroit these days 
except we never seem to succeed. So we keep coming back, whether in actual visits or in books and movies and TV shows, in newspaper articles and magazines, vengeful and angry, angry at ourselves too, that we can't just walk away. So living with Detroit, which is the story of living with ourselves, has mostly been a story about moving away from things and each other towards something we imagine always to be better and for a long time getting there and then denying that whatever gets left behind has any claim upon us still. That's what our history of forgetting amounts to, denial. It's the American way, it's our way, more brilliantly and wastefully revealed here in this city than anywhere else. This is the story I want to tell and the ideas I hope to explain. Okay, well that's really philosophically a big picture that Jerry gives us and it's really relevant to the uh, current situation in Detroit. It's really a model of our uh, re renaissance and rebirth and it's a place, I think you were very wise in selecting Detroit. The weather is a little bit more questionable in Detroit. It's very questionable here in New York with this cold front. Uh, Southern California has a magnificent climate, but the climate in Detroit in terms of the national interest, Detroit is a very important part of a rebirth that seems to be taking place among some of our most creative elements within the society and with the people there. And it has a great uh, impetus, not only to the city of Detroit, the state of Michigan, but to the United States of America. And the national interest is very much uh, wrapped up, uh, is best served by the revigoration of the Detroit and it must be very satisfying you to be part of a team at Wayne State University, an institutional that anchors that together in a cultural sense. And I think you made a very wise choice. Do you still feel that way now that you've been there for a few months and years? I do, and and and, and I think that um, the city has changed quite a bit, even in my two and a half years there. And as I love to say, there's never a dull day in Detroit. Okay, very yeah. good. Well, it's very good. We've had this uh, discussion of Detroit. We're going to go on to a second part where we're going to uh, get into the nuts and bolts of the un university itself, of which you're a part. And uh, it's been your pleasure to have had the perceptions in of Wayne M. Raskin, Ph.D., mathematician extraordinaire, I would like to add. And uh, the basis, which is the basis of much of the scientific advancement of the human condition. Thank you for viewing. We'll be coming okay. back uh, with a second part to this program where we'll focus on the implications of Wayne State University as part of the renaissance of that major part of the area of the, of the United States and the world. Thank you for viewing. And thank you, uh, Wayne, for coming in. It's very good talking to you. Look forward to a part two where we can talk about your your university that I'm an um, alumnus of, proudly so, okay? It's been a great pleasure being here. Thank you for having me. Okay, thank you for viewing. We'll be coming back with a part two um, tomorrow, actually, and when this is aired. Yeah. Thanks again. <laughs>